This is a relay project. Real talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. It's Friday the 13th, and you're tuned into Real Talk. Thanks for joining us live or later on demand on YouTube, on uh, podcast platforms, perhaps streaming live on the Mixler audio app uh, presented by our friends at California Closets. John Hicks here with me, Ryan Jesperson, on the final episode of the week. Do you get freaked out by Friday the 13th? Uh, We were just saying how we shouldn't mention it. Now you've mentioned it. Well. The stream is down. (laughs) (laughs) Are you a superstitious guy? Like, do Do you keep an eye out? for cracks on the sidewalk do you worry about no. walking under ladders do you care no. about any of that long stuff? ago i stopped having the ocd part of my life where i had to touch the doorknob three or four times i've learned to get out of it but no i i, I don't but i i do kind of take take a bit of a bit of a stance against mentioning it so much on the day because i feel like something <laughs> will happen if you you know yeah, it's okay. inevitable fair enough we mm. we decided uh just in impromptu fashion literally 10 seconds before we got started so i see there's 19 votes on our unofficial unscientific twitter poll are you superstitious does friday the 13th freak you out we've given you three choices here yes no or pass the potatoes uh i'm rooting for pass the potatoes and uh we're gonna see how that poll will turn out it looks to me as though okay 24 votes a, a little bump there john so far 83 percent of respondents say they are not superstitious Uh, 16.7 percent of respondents would like us to pass the potatoes and officially at this point zero percent of people have said that friday the 13th freaks them out this might like it this might be much ado about nothing (laughs) yeah we promised to get back into the results of another unscientific unofficial twitter poll this came as a result of our conversation yesterday with jay ingram which was really wonderful you know jay he's uh, been a longtime science educator and broadcaster in canada and um he's got this new partnership with health canada with the government of canada he's really mm-hmm. working to uh, deepen people's understanding of uh, neurological uh, diseases in particular dementia we were talking alzheimer's yesterday and mm-hmm. steps that you can take to stave off Alzheimer's. Now, to be clear, before we get emails, we know there is no cure to Alzheimer's, but there are things that you can do to, to, in a way, try to hold it at bay. Yeah. Some of us may have it embedded in our genetic code that we're going to wrestle with this in our in our later years. Some of us tragically may wrestle with it in our younger years. You hear of of early Mm -hmm. onset, uh, but a fascinating conversation yesterday. We got talking. Mm -hmm. Would you, given the chance, want to know the cause and or date? of your death ahead of time it's heavy lifting but it's a great subject it's a great talker and um the poll is going to be open for about another six hours so if you're listening to us live you can get to it through the mid-afternoon but i don't see the numbers changing they haven't changed essentially three quarters of people say they wouldn't want to know 73 Mm percent say they would not want to know the date and or cause of their death ahead of time a quarter of people 27 percent said yes yeah and then, of course, people are making the solid points that we were making on the show yesterday, like Derek, who says, like, well, by knowing you would have the ability to alter it. Right. Like an early heart attack. That's what we were talking about. It's yeah. what got us talking. If you knew if, if all of a sudden you knew you were going to collapse at, at the uh, Calgary Stampede on the Midway, uh-huh. I shouldn't spell it out specifically in case that does happen to one of us. Yeah. But, you know, with a corn dog in one hand and a, and a root beer float in the other uh, at age 41, then you would make life changes. Right. Like Derek says, an early heart attack. You, if the if the target kept shifting, um, depending on your actions, it might consume your life trying to dodge a bullet that would hit you sooner or later. Like mm-hmm. We're all going to die. Uh, Dave Taylor, former radio personality, former Alberta MLA. Great to have, hear from Dave. He says, do I look like Captain Christopher Pike to you? Um, do I acknowledge that I had to Google it? It's a Star Trek reference. Yeah. You know, I was talking to former Edmonton Mayor Don Iveson the other day who dropped a Star Trek reference. I mean, it was totally lost. Donnie was in it, the building. He was in the building. It was, yeah. it was a waste of a Star Trek reference. Uh, this one from Jackie gave me pause to think. Jackie, you said, I, I feel like I already know how, just not sure when. Uh, there's way too many people gone and more of them daily. I feel like I'm just waiting for my turn. That from Jackie. Much love to you this weekend, Jackie. Matt says the future is unwritten. I like that. I agree with Matt. Yeah. And if if I want to know the future, I'd rather go to like a tarot card reader because then I can be like, that's bullshit. Well, I was going to say, you can, they, they can just make your wallet lighter. I don't want to take 300 the, bucks out of your pocket. I don't want to hear the exact educated guess. But what I did learn from Jay yesterday is that three things we can do to stave off Alzheimer's is well, they're pretty obvious ones. Get more sleep, drink less, 
And the one that I thought was fascinating, go back to school. Yeah. People who go back and get or, or who stay in school longer stave off Alzheimer's longer. I That's, thought that was fascinating. Yeah. And he led with that. That was like kind of the first thing that he got to. And, and mm-hmm. he was saying that this is something that researchers have have been able to determine and that statistically it holds up. The only problem is that if you're talking to somebody in you know 65, 70, 75 years old, it doesn't really help them to say no. you know if you would have stayed in school or even longer us at like in you your know, middle age. Like, but I will have you know that I am going back to college, and you will be fitting the bell. You're gonna go to Athabasca University. <laughs> I'm that's, going that's to a good you. idea. <laughs> we got some some comments here, and I love this. This is real talk. Like Andrew was having a, a brutal day yesterday, and and he chimed in on our poll. He says, "I went to a funeral this afternoon for a former colleague." She passed away at 44 after a five-month illness. Can you imagine? Two young children, a devastated husband. Andrew says we don't know what's around the corner. Uh, Knowing the expiry date on our own mortality would help us live life to the fullest. So, so maybe Andrew is one of those that voted yes. Wesley said it would be convenient. Ron said the more I, I love this from Ron. The more I think about it, says Ron, the less I would want to know. And I know that maybe for some of you, having the question just bang around in your brain maybe got you thinking about stuff yesterday. It might be kind of funny to to get into how the impact of these polls works out when, when people are walking down the sidewalk or out for their morning jog. Uh, Keith says, this sounds really depressing. I would have to make some huge purchases on credit <laughs> to compensate. Oh, no. Leave your family to clean up the mess, yeah. right? Keith would be out getting the uh, the old 96er, picking up the big prime ribs. Uh, uh, Ke- you know, T said, I think I would do a pro and con table before making my decision. David says my anxiety would totally fuck that up. I'm going to pass on this question. Jennifer says she wouldn't want to live with that knowledge. So there mm-hmm. you go. Three out of four people in our unofficial, unscientific Twitter poll say they would not want to know. Artie Miss in the chat says, uh, tarot cards will not tell you when you're going to die, silly. And I replied, oh, well. My wife just got a pack of them, but <laughs> did she really? <laughs> she did, yeah. So tarot cards, when you get them, uh, apparently they can either speak to the person who holds them or not. And she saw a post which was exactly that: someone who had bought a pack, they weren't speaking to them, and they gave them away for free. So we picked them up this week. I went by a house and picked them up. So she's she's getting into that now, yeah. I wish you wouldn't have said that your wife got tarot cards because I was about to go off on tarot cards, but now I'm not going to. Because <laughs> well, I, I mean, love her. She's she great. I respect her. Yet, very, yeah, so I we'll know. See. Do, you want to, do you honestly believe that stuff? Do you honestly believe in the people who are looking into crystal balls? And My wife telling- keeps me young because she is a big believer in lots of things where okay. I'm like, eh, does that work? But she's also a believer in facts and science. So yeah. I think it's more for entertainment, right? Yeah, 100% for entertainment. Mm-hmm. I, would, I, would, I would hesitate to go to like a fortune teller or a tarot card reader or whatever they'd prefer to be called a soothsayer. Have you ever been to one? No. So my Uh, mom, my mother, what if they said, what if they told you something that would like knock your socks off and mess you up? hundred percent. My mother went to one though, and they know things, but uh, they're also, you know, fortune tellers are really good readers of people. They're like really good poker players. They know people's tells. So, but for my mom, it was a pretty eye-opening experience. So, All right. Brenda on the live chat says, I've picked up my latest copy of Edify. She Ooh. says, but I haven't read it yet. Brenda, girl, that's awesome. It's great to hear from you this morning. And uh, um, we want to let you know that it actually just coming up in a couple of minutes, mm-hmm. we're going to check in with the Edifiers, uh, three of those, uh, you know, movers and shakers, let's say, community contributors. These are people that have sort of gone above and beyond in different applications in their life, in their, in their professional endeavors, in their personal commitments and their philanthropy uh, as recognized by edify magazine and their edifiers issue you you heard slavo check the sculptor on this show last week if you want to check out that interview he was also featured we had slavo on ahead of time because he had his big art hunt mm. just this past weekend he's uh he's done this thing now i think he does it quarterly four times a year slavo uh, takes a piece of art a sculpture this this metal sculpture that he does you, just follow him on social media you can find it in the show notes all of his handles for instagram and twitter Twitter and the like, uh, and you can see what he does. But he had a ton of people. I was watching the buzz. It was trending on Twitter, online, people out 
doing the uh, what do you call it? Like the uh, what's it called when people are out trying to find things based on maps and clues? It's the uh, not geocaching, but it's like geocaching in a way, right? And they were trying to find a this sculpture. Hunt? Yeah, I mean, like in a way, a treasure hunt. And yeah, but I, th- I think it, it sounds so much more tech and modern and cool to call it a geocaching adventure. But I think technically it wouldn't qualify. But he like he, scavenger he, hunt. He kind of he kind of he kind of <laughs> nestles these sculptures like at the foot of trees or wherever yeah. covered somewhat by brush and and ultimately somebody finds it and and uh, you know earns themselves i guess they win it but they earn themselves a sculpture so slava was in edify and we're going to meet three more of them today which is going to be really really great um i'm gonna I, i'll keep and we'll keep popping in on the live chat to see where people stand on mm-hmm. things like tarot cards and, and fortune readers and like what about this emma says i don't believe in it but i went to a psychic for fun at the Russian Tea Room. That's a, a spot locally in Edmonton, just off White Avenue. I've always wondered about the Russian Tea Room. This is like nobody ever in there, but the lights are always on and they keep their bills paid. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Emma says the the, uh, the psychic told me that the letters A, T, and K would be significant and I would meet someone tall and handsome in three to five weeks. Mm. Okay. I see. There you go, Emma. Okay. Artie says, yeah, if I knew for sure the date of my death, I'd probably quit work and stop the student loan payments. Yeah, you're not alone. Well, listen, we've got we've got some some emails pulled, you know, trash talks coming up today, of course, presented by our friends at Local Environmental. But but there's there are a couple emails in particular. They, they requested that they be left out of trash talk, in particular, this one from Ron. And so I thought this might be a good opportunity to get to it before we check in with our edifiers. Do we have three uh, John in the bullpen? We're ready to rock. OK, ready to they're go. good to go in just a second. Ron, this is something to think about. We talked about the anger button when Charles Adler joined us on Monday. We looked at a Globe and Mail editorial, a piece that suggested that conservative leader Pierre Polyev has got to push that anger button less frequently if he wants to win the support of women voters in Canada. The assertion being that Polyev, the conservatives, can't win government if they can't win over women. This, according to polls, way out from a federal election. We're not even close to one. Well, it got Ron thinking. And he said, after after several years, you know, hearing you talk about the anger button on the show, constant anger, constant barbs being thrown between political parties and on divisive social issues around the world in developed democracies. Ron says, I'm done. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. He says, there's only so much a person can take before they throw up their hands and say, screw it. I'm done. And walk away from it all. The, the ugliness, the divisiveness that serves no one but makes everybody angry at each other. Ron says, I'm not angry. And, I, and, I, and, and he says, and I hope this isn't taken as a trash talk. Ron, message received. He says, I try to live by a policy of being less angry online and not replying to anger on platforms like Twitter. Doesn't serve anybody. Doesn't serve me. And it sure doesn't serve the person on the other end of that computer, that phone, or that tablet. He says, I, I guess I'm just I'm worn out by this constant culture of being full-on angry. He says, now, to clarify, please don't confuse me being worn out by this constant trend uh, as apathy. I'm very much tuned into politics, and I wouldn't tune into real talk if I wasn't. And I also wouldn't pledge to vote in the provincial election in a future federal election in 2023 or beyond. He says, hopefully beyond. Ron says, I'm sorry for the downer of an email, but I just wanted to share my thoughts. That's not a downer, buddy. That's real talk for real life. And you know what I love about it? And the reason why we wanted to read it right now, Ron, is because this roundtable, this Friday's roundtable, I think is going to edify you. I think it's going to fill your cup. I think it's going to remind us that there are a bunch of people out there that are doing things that are not driven or motivated or rewarded by anger. It feels like a perfect way to wrap up our week. That's coming up in less than two minutes. These conversations happen on Real Talk because of phenomenal partners like our friends at Park Power who have a new promo code out and you're going to want to pay attention to this because you could save $150. The new promo code, write it down, is RealTalk23. Nice and easy to remember, all one word, RealTalk23. Here's how it works. It's a bundling incentive. So when you take your business over to Park Power, when you sign up and it asks you for your promo code, you punch in Realtalk23. If you're buying electricity off them, that's 50 bucks off your first bill. 
If you bundle natural gas into that, that's another 50 bucks. That's 100 bucks. And if you go to Park Power for your high-speed internet, they're going to knock off another 50 bucks with the promo code REALTALK23. Your first bill will have 150 bucks taken off. No strings attached. When you bring your business to Park Power with the promo code REALTALK23 at parkpower.ca. It's a perfect weekend to... Browse around kubienergy.ca, the website. You can check out their products and services, understand what they can do for home solar, commercial solar, even energy storage. These Tesla power walls that everybody's talking about, I mean, that is next level. If your family's considering picking up an EV, you want to have the best setup that makes the most sense to be as efficient as possible. That's exactly what Kubi does, and they can get on it right away, starting with a free quote today at kubienergy.ca. Don't forget, Kubi presenting positive reflections every Monday on the show. Email us your good news story. Kubi loves to tell them every Monday right here on Real Talk. At Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food, they are feeding the pups of Alberta with the best quality food on the market. I know that with a fact. I say it with confidence because we see the benefits of feeding Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food to our beloved pups, Moses and Monroe. You go to granddog.ca, click on the blog link. They've got a new post, which is great. What is high quality protein for dogs and cats? Like when people talk about protein quality, how do we know what's best for our pets? And why is quality so important for our pet's health? Plus, they've got their Four Leaf Rover bundles here to stay. These are the bundles for joint care. Our boxer, 10 years old, Moses, uses the joint care Four Leaf Rover bundles. There's the basics. Monroe, our three-year-old lab, uses that. Allergies, senior support, healthy skin, immunity support, and the Kibble Bowl Boost. You can pick up quality raw food for your dogs or cats today at granddog.ca. The promo code REALTALK knocks 10% off your first-time order. And, of course, you know every Friday our Real Talk roundtables are presented by our friends at Urban Timber Reclaimed Wood. Of course, home renovations are on the rise, and Urban Timber's hottest seller right now is their reclaimed, hand-hewn, reclaimed mantles. These are made from white oak timbers or over 200 years old. Can you believe it? They add character to any room, old or new. Urban Timber has Canada's largest selection of reclaimed mantles. Also, a wide variety available to look at in person. Come run your hands across this wood in their brand new Edmonton showroom. It's open Saturdays 10 to 4. They've also got coffee tables, dining tables in stock, ready to deliver. With Urban Timber, you bring the story home. You can visit them in their West Edmonton showroom or visit them online. Find all the details at urbantimber.ca. Urban Timber presenting a conversation every Friday right here on the show where we dig below the surface to understand what makes people tick. And today we check in with three of the stars of Edify's brand new Edifier issue. The Edifier Awards, recognizing those who make demonstrable and significant commitments and contributions to their community. That includes the individual featured on the cover there. Hey, big lender. Pilar Martinez is the chief executive officer of the Edmonton Public Library. From transformative early literacy programs to the community-led service framework in the library, Pilar's commitment to service excellence has helped make a positive impact at EPL and in the lives of of Edmontonians. We're also really grateful for an opportunity to check in with Simba Nyazika, the co-founder and CEO of Lenica Research Group. It's a company with a vision to improve global mental health. Uh, Lenica has developed a digital mental health platform that allows clinicians to integrate patient data from wearable devices. We talked about them this week on the show. The platform Peak Cognition allows clinicians to package and automate therapies based on each patient's individual needs. How cool is that? And rounding out our Real Talk roundtable today, we're very grateful that Mega Sharma is making time for us. Mega does great work with Apega and the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion portfolio, where she serves as the coordinator, including leading the Women and Gender Equality Grant Project. It's a research study on the impact of COVID-19 on women in engineering and geoscience. 
to our edifiers. Welcome to the show and a good morning to you. Pilar, you always, I would imagine, get a real kick out of being featured on the cover of a magazine, let alone a, ma- let alone a magazine that is celebrating innovators and achievers like this. Where's your head at with the honor? Oh my gosh, I, I am incredibly honored and incredibly honored to be in the company of both uh, Simba and Mega and uh, being part of this conversation, Ryan. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I, I'm surprised. I was very surprised and, and uh, most honored. Did you, when when you were growing up, like, did you, I always like to pick people's brains on how they got to where they're at. Yeah. Did, did you have a background in library services? Did you have a, a background in executive leadership? How did you wind up as CEO of the EPL? Well, yeah, really good question. And no, I didn't even know librarianship was a career. Mm. You know, I grew up in a household uh, with two parents who were in the service industry. Mom was a teacher and, and dad was a doctor, and both of whom were very involved in community, volunteered. Dad was the chair of the, the school board. So that kind of um, culture and those values were very much instilled in me as a kid. And uh, so I always knew I wanted to do something to help folks, to to make a difference in the community and give back. And I just happened upon uh, an amazing librarian when I was doing my undergrad and, and doing an honors uh, project that uh, who I really connected with, who was incredibly helpful. And I thought, wow, this and that sort of quest for knowledge, solving a mystery, uh, making a difference uh, that 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 really appealed to me in terms of a career. I have uh, such fond memories and, and like we're talking literally 35, 40 years ago of, of being with my parents and and walking out of the library with as many books as we could carry. And I and I remember even as a kid, you know, when you have a plastic card to put in your new wallet, your Velcro wallet, that's a huge deal. Getting a, li- <laughs> a library card was so cool. Um, I'm looking forward to circling back with you in a second and talking about the the chain, the the uh, the uh, evolving mandate of libraries and how they're changing and acting as these community hubs, um, you know, continuing the tradition that's been there for so many years. Uh, Simba, my understanding is that you became involved in your field of work, your research, maybe based on a a personal or family experience, uh, the story of your grandmother. Would you be able to tell us about that? Yeah, so originally, uh, me and my family, we are from Zimbabwe, and we migrated to Canada in 2005. And so when we came here, we got to uh, do a little bit of schooling, working, and then we decided to go back to visit family back home. And so when I arrived back at Zimbabwe, one of uh, the things I was looking forward to is meeting one of my grandmas. And she always used to ask you, how are you, by saying, are you happy? Are you happy? Are you happy? And even if you're not happy, you had to say yes, because the question would be like, why aren't you happy? Uh, but when I did visit her, uh, of course, she didn't recognize me Um just trying to remember who I am, who uh, my parents were. And it was only on the last day that uh, when we were leaving, when she's like, oh, you are the son of my son who's in America. Like, close enough. Uh Yes, Uh, that's uh, that's me. And, you know, just kind of that sense of the person is still there, but a part of them is not there. And so when we came back, the idea was, could we do something to, on one end, prevent or mitigate the extent of uh, conditions like dementia and then on the other hand being able to provide tools that better support individuals with dementia and other mental health disorders of course so the so the longer that you studied uh you know you you earned uh, a couple of different degrees right a, a bachelor of science in both psychology and neuroscience to to sort of pave the foundation for what you were going to do when did you start understanding how how tech innovation could fit into this in a way that would help people uh, not just not just help healthcare providers diagnose some of these conditions, but also assist in life following a diagnosis. So after my undergrad, my neuroscience one, I ended up publishing a research article on driving performance and behavior, which was super exciting. Except I realized that once you publish the paper, its translation into the real world for that paper specifically was non-existent. And so in kind of realizing that we're doing a lot of great research, not only in Edmonton, but across Canada, and then the way technology is progressing, if we're able to merge the two together, then a lot of the great research that's being done could actually be translated to actually help the people that it's meant to help. And so at Lenica, what we try to do is create a platform that allows people to merge that research so it can actually get to the people that it needs to help. And so we do that again by putting it in the hands of clinicians and researchers. 
It's so fascinating. I'm so grateful that you're on the roundtable, Simba. We, we talked in two different conversations this week. On Tuesday, we talked about how wearable devices uh, have uh, people have realized over time that that actually the data that's coming from them is is not actually that accurate. And then we talked yesterday with Jay Ingram, who's just a wonderful storyteller when it comes to science about dementia, and about Alzheimer's, and how we're 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 deepening our understanding that we don't know how to cure it. Maybe our understanding of of what can lead up to it, or some of the factors that can contribute to it. What's been your awareness like? The, the more experience you've gleaned here, and as you've become a obviously a leader in in the field about how much we know or don't know about the human brain. So it's up. It's accurate to say like the wearable devices, the data is not as accurate yet, but what we are doing is creating an infrastructure that when that data is going to be accurate, the system is going to be there. And our system, what it actually utilizes, is not just the wearable data, but it's a hardware agnostic platform that allows people to integrate any data system. Even the clinical grade data systems can be integrated into our platform. The reason why we use some of the uh, consumer devices is because they're easily accessible. And as a therapist, for example, if you want to be able to monitor between session uh, sleep patterns or between session stress uh, stress levels, that information can be invaluable to tell you how the treatment you are administering is actually helping the treatment uh, the patient. Huh. Mega, welcome to the show. Did did you, as as a young person, like, were you always keen on a career in in STEM? Like, it, did did you want to be an engineer when you were like seven years old, or how did your journey start? No, not at all. Um, I actually wasn't a great student, um, so my engineering journey is kind of interesting because I think everyone imagines you know, like the nerds in kind of high school that go into engineering, but I was definitely not that. I was very confused um, and not trying my best throughout school. Um, but uh, I knew that I, my brain was just very math and science oriented. Um, so that was just a field that I knew that I would eventually go in. Um, and I wasn't super fond of biology. So I was like, okay, it looks like, you know, something in physics and chemistry. And um, I had my physics course in grade 11, and it was just completely changed my perception of um, where I wanted to go. And my physics teacher was just incredible. And she was like, you know, I think you'd be a really good engineer. You ask really good questions. And I didn't even really know what engineering was or what they did. And I was like, oh, okay, that sounds great. And then I looked at the requirements and I was like, yep, I'm not going to be able to get in. Oh. Um, definitely did not have the grades. And, uh, but I was like, you know what, like, I think this is for me. And so I actually ended up going to center high and upgrading my marks. And um, it was kind of a process for me to get into it. But once I got into my undergrad, I excelled a lot um, in my courses and I was a really good student oh, I'm and so I got really involved um, on campus and in my community and a lot of diversity work and I really just found my passion so yeah it's I always talk students and kids and like you know when parents are really stressed out about their kids yeah. they're like oh they're not studying enough they're not doing enough and I'm like you know what it doesn't matter like it just like once you know what you want to do like there's so many options for you to like go and get into it and um yeah, it, yeah. Mega, I'm going to come back to you in like 10 seconds, but but Pilar is smiling so big, her face is going to break. What's what's making you smile so big? Well, what's she saying? I think just what Mega was talking about, you know, you don't really know where you're going to land and and it's it's just connect, making that connection with with somebody who inspires you can make such a difference in terms of where you end up with your career. So that's why I'm smiling. It do very you, much resonates. Mega, you, thanks. Pilar, you you mentioned, I mean, you mentioned the influence of your parents, uh, but was there somebody else in your journey that like you meet? I can think of names. I can recall names right now. People that had formative influences on me. Did you have one, Pilar? Many folks. You know, I remember Ms. McKay, who was my English teacher throughout high school, and I, I think instilled in me, and I think through my family too, very much a love of learning. And that's still, I really am a curious person. I love to read about things and understand things. So uh, absolutely many individuals along the way, like and Mr. Mercer, that librarian I talked with, uh, 
And then when I was deciding whether or not to do my master's in library science, I, I just happened to select somebody from a university librarian at the University of Lethbridge. And she was, um, is and was amazing, very, very much a leader in the community, very dynamic and vivacious. Uh, so it just, uh, I think just happenstance, I happened, I was lucky to meet the folks I did that uh, led me to the path that I'm on. Oh, it's so great. Uh, I, I, th this is a total diversion. I was listening to a podcast yesterday. <laughs> uh, John Krasinski, you know, like the star actor was talking about, I didn't know this about him. It turns out he was a script intern uh, for Conan O'Brien way back in the day and he was talking about his first appearance years later as an he was now on the office and he was talking about his his first appearance on a late night show was indeed with Conan O'Brien and the biggest thing for him he said he just about choked up as he was getting set to walk out you know the curtain puller like that's the person's job they pull the curtain so the <laughs> guests can walk out and I guess the curtain puller looked at him and said Johnny we are just so proud of you we're all because he was the intern running around those hallways and i just love those stories of the people <laughs> that have had influence in people's lives coming up so so mega you 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 get involved i'm so grateful that you shared with us that like your marks weren't that great in high school my marks were terrible in high school to be <laughs> honest with you but i'm not an engineer so consider that but then but because because i think a lot of times young or they'll hear about people that are big achievers and and maybe they feel like their current circumstance maybe that they've they've missed the boat you know and that it's too late and and I love that you know you're an example that when you find something that you actually have a passion for that you're actually interested in and you apply yourself to it sky's the limit no yeah definitely um and yeah so I think there's a lot of pressure on people to like especially nowadays to figure out what they want to do. Like, you know, they're like, if you want to get into med school, you have to start volunteering from like grade nine, you know, it's just, to me, it's just really silly. Um, and there's, yeah, there's so many ways there's people in med school at like at age 40. Um, so, I mean, it's, I think we really do narrow down and weed out a lot of people that have potential when we put these pressures on, especially young students is, you know, maybe, maybe with this pressure is just preventing people from actually going into fields that they would be really successful in. Um, so, yeah, just keep encouraging the people around you. Um, it sometimes takes a little bit longer. And like I said, once you get into what you want to do, you tend to excel a lot and even more so than people that might have had an easier way getting in. Because I know in engineering, um, it was hard for me to get in. And so I was used to studying. I was used to you know, like really having a good time management schedule and like I really wanted this. So I was really passionate about it. Whereas there were a lot of students in my classes that had gone in, you know, right away and they maybe had really supportive parents. Um, my parents were working crazy jobs. So I didn't have a lot of people doing my homework with me. And so maybe they had a lot of support um, to get all their homework done, I had really great marks. So when they got into engineering, they realized, you know what? Engineering coursework is really hard. So if you don't know how to do it and if you don't have that base um, learning of like really trying and, you know, being able to get 40 percent and being like, you know what, that's OK, um, mm. I'm going to keep going and not just giving up because it's like the first time you've gone less than like 80. Right. Yeah. So there's all these things Um Although no, yeah, nobody, you, you got to You got to make your mistakes in post-secondary. So so you don't earn a 40 percent score on the first bridge you design. Right. We want everyone to make make their mistakes in the heart surgeons and the bridge builders. I'd prefer they make their mistakes in university. Now, now, um, and, and obviously we're going to make our way around the panel, but I want to get to a point here, Mega. Your feature, people can read these features in the latest uh, issue of Edify, of course, in print. They do a beautiful job in print or online at edifyedmonton.com. You can read all of these features right now. Mega, so you, you have these hurdles, uh, one of them maybe being your marks as you graduate out of grade 12, but but then you crack the, the faculty and you get in and then you realize that there's not a lot of women in STEM, right? And, and your involvement here, starting with wisest, maybe you can tell us what wisest is, is really, I think one of the reasons probably uh, why you're featured in these pages of this, of this issue. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I kind of realized that my story was a little bit unique when I got into engineering. Like I said, I, you know, wasn't the biggest nerd necessarily. And um, I like hair and makeup and fashion and stuff. So I, I felt a little bit different, especially in like the hyper masculine 
um, environment of engineering in my undergrad. So I was looking for ways to get involved in student groups that um, really resonated with me. And at the time in engineering, there wasn't necessarily a student group um, like based on belonging. It was a lot of like, you know, um, building a car and building a satellite, which are all just super cool as well. But I was kind of looking for more of like that belongingness and like, especially feeling kind of like I stuck out a lot and I didn't really know how to be masculine or try to fit in. So um, I was looking for groups that were promoting um, women in STEM. And so I came across Wisest, which is just an incredible organization. Um, so they stand for women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I got involved with them. And then but I realized um, some of the issues in engineering are really engineering prone, if that makes sense. So um, there is a really great organization, works all across STEM. Um, but like I said, there weren't a lot of people from engineering in WISEST either. So I was like, ah, oh, like, it'd be really cool to find my place in engineering to do this kind of work. So um one of my friends came up to me and she was like, you know, we like rant a lot about these like women issues and stuff. If I started a club, would you be interested in joining? Because I think we should really just do something about it. If we really want a place for ourselves, why don't we just create it? Because I'm sure there's more people that feel this way. Yeah. And I was like, that's great. You know what? Yeah, I would love to join that. And then so she created the club and I um, became the vice president of research um, because I'm very research oriented. Um, and uh, so that was an entire situation, but um, yeah, it was really interesting starting a grassroots organization and the faculty of engineering was just blown away by us wanting to do this. And they gave us so much support and so much guidance. And it's a very successful club. It's called Diversity in Engineering and they still exist. Um, and since we have graduated and they have since then, you know, had exec teams, had elections, um, just growing. Recently they had, um, so in engineering, you have gear week at the first week of engineering. It's just a week for all the different areas um, to like welcome the new, like new people to the faculty. So there's a whole bunch of like challenges around campus. And for the first time this year, they had a drag show at gear week. And I was just like, diversity and engineering, like I just was blown away. I could have never ever thought the faculty of engineering on gear week would have a drag show yeah. and the um there were mechanical engineers and petroleum engineers dressed up you know cross-gendered and dancing up there and i was like this is a totally different atmosphere of engineering that i joined in and i'm so happy that this exists now but just incredible uh, I would for people listening on the podcast, they should know that you have been smiling the entire time you've been talking, <laughs> uh, and and the, and our other panelists are smiling, listening to you, which is great. the The enthusiasm, the optimism. It's why we read Ron's email before we introduced the three of you, because I was like, <laughs> if you feel like you're looking for ways to turn down the anger button in your life, listen to these three edifiers, uh, which is great. Simba, what what sort of barriers? I mean, I'm sure there's tons when you're talking about tech and medicine and healthcare and pushing the envelope, and that let alone the entrepreneurial side i mean i would imagine there's challenges all over the place as you forge into the great unknown of of brain science and brain health i mean i mean let alone what you're doing and, and i want to pick your brain around how you're working with athletes with with peak cognition but what's a big barrier that you overcame or that stood in your way at some point in your professional journey how long do you have yeah <laughs> <laughs> sure we got time um I think there's a few barriers, both like internal and within like Lenica when you're trying to start something, something new, right? So I know one of the things as a company that we face very often is that research, for example, is a very slow moving um, area. Right? You need to get your ethics, you need to do the research properly, you need to uh, to get the publications and all those other components. While technology is very fast moving. And so sometimes when you try to marry those two together, it's like one is trying to kind of figure out, are we innovative? Do we have to be research-based? And then we are always trying to kind of have this uh, tension between the two. Uh, the other thing, of course, is uh, funding. We have been fortunate that in Edmonton and Alberta, there's a lot of uh, great funding opportunities for entrepreneurs. But a lot of the funding that's required to get a digital health product to market um, 
it has been a barrier, but we have had a lot of support there. And then, of course, the internal barriers. My educational background is just undergrad degrees. And so sometimes when people are like, oh, you're in the healthcare space, do you have a PhD? Are you a doctor? Are you a researcher? Um, there's always that, do we actually know what we're doing? Uh -huh. Fortunately, I'm surrounded by an amazing team of people that are way smarter than me, that kind of help us kind of navigate um, what we need to do in, in terms of like creating the product and then also ensuring that it works within the system and for the people that we're designing it for. Mm -hmm. And I think finally, I'll add that one of the things that we have realized is no matter how well your technology works, it has to work within the context of the people that will be using it. And so one of the things that we are really working on right now is we know that our system works and it works really well. How can we make sure that it works for the healthcare professionals? Because they are busy, they are also overwhelmed, but they also want to help their uh, their patients. So trying to manage all those constraints and make sure that we still stay zen, uh, zen as we do that uh, is quite a few of the barriers that we have faced, just to mention a few. I'll, I'll circle back and ask you about the work you're doing with athletes because it strikes me as a completely different avenue and absolutely incredible. And I expect to see gold medal podiums, uh, you know, I mean, sort of on your website. He, we've worked with them and them and them uh, as the years go on. How exciting is that? But, but Pilar, it's not lost on me that as Simba's talking about uh, you know, for example, Mega will say, OK, you got to have your PNG if you want to work on projects and society demands it and professional associations like Apega demand it. And it makes sense. We understand why you have to have a professional designation to build a skyscraper. But you must be surrounded like when you actually walk the library, when you actually go mingle with the people that are using it, you must be surrounded with people that are educating themselves. And as we see society's attitudes change, like like m more, you know, students are more keen on, on things like trade schools and polytechnic schools. And there seems to be less of a a demand people feel like you had to go to university back in the day even if it, it was a sort of a, a square peg in a round hole type thing uh you must see inspiration every single day of people educating themselves and going unconventional routes to get to where they want to be yeah absolutely there's some amazing stories of how folks have found their um success through um coming to the library and and reading and connecting and learning and i think we are sort of that non-formal learning hub of our city where everybody from all walks of life are welcome and they can they can take the traditional route which is reading a book they can learn about our amazing technology in our makerspace or the fab lab um, they can come and interact with our stimulation wall and there was just a feature in the journal about the uh, space exhibit which if you haven't seen it yet just it is fabulous that we worked with the u of a and some indigenous knowledge keepers to highlight the fantastic content that um, there's so much skill in our city that we're highlighting or you want to come and learn how to to, to cook and, and understand nutrition and food literacy uh, we have settlement practitioners that help new newcomers uh, at most locations in our city. So we really are uh, uh, that sort of hub, that that hub where people can learn at their own pace, um, how they want to learn uh, and take their own journey uh, that make, make meets their needs the best. Pilar, we've had people in our live chat that are like recounting their childhood memories. Of, uh, like Tony, for example, said her dad used to drive her to the library every two weeks so she could load up on books. And we have these fond memories. For people that haven't stepped foot inside a brick and mortar library, uh, and maybe I shouldn't even limit my question to that context because you could yeah. probably blow that out the door, right? But I, I could. <laughs> for, for someone that hasn't, let's say, visited or utilized a library for like 20 years, 25 years, what what would blow their mind about how it's most different? I mean, what's the mandate now? Well, I think it, it's not going to be sort of the, the shush place that you might have experienced as a kid or in, in your university or school years. I think it's very dynamic, um, very welcoming. Staff are out on the floor roving, interacting with folks to see, you know, how can we help you? We've got a gamer space and gamer spaces at, at multiple locations across the city. There's e-resources. You can take a course through um, LinkedIn Learning. You can learn how to cook, as I mentioned, in our amazing kitchen. You can learn how to make something that um, a dryer part with a 3D printer in our in our um, makerspace. Uh, we had somebody, a teacher's assistant, print Cree syllabics to be able to help 
her students uh, learn Cree. You can, speaking of Cree, you can come and uh, visit our Piasua Skyken, which is our um, ceremonial space in Milner that is um, nurtured and uh, sort of uh, held close by our elder in residence and take Cree language classes, learn about Cree culture or indigenous culture and identity. You can browse the art that's in our spaces. There are so many things I think that would really surprise and delight people. And you talked about barriers. And I think the one of the biggest barriers is sort of that lack of awareness. And uh, folks sort of, uh, they go right to the stereotype and think that, that we are the same place that they might have experienced 20 years ago. And we are not. Yeah. And I think we demonstrated that through our Library of the Year Award, which I must uh, say is still, we are still the only Canadian library. Um, this is a North American wide award, which has won this award. And that really kind of highlights and, and recognizes that innovation and that dedication to customer service. And one other thing I'll mention, we do, our community-led really is about taking our services outside our walls and breaking down barriers to those who, who need to understand those barriers and break them down to provide those library services. So we have folks who are out in the community delivering programs, early literacy programs, digital literacy programs out in their organizations. We have literacy vans for them who go out to the underserved areas of our community and provide um, robotic um, fun games. So kids can learn about uh, coding. So I think, yeah, as you mentioned, I, people who haven't stepped into a library for the past decade would be, I uh, encourage them to do so. You, yeah. You'll be surprised and delighted. Yeah. And hey, listen, I, I, I say this at least once a week. I apologize to a guest today. It's going to be you, Pilar, because I'm so eager to talk to people that I like blow through their CV and I don't mention all the things. Um, but it's great that you mentioned Library of the Year. I should also mention that under your leadership, uh, Edmonton, our home city, was the first Canadian city named. And as I understand, I think it's still the only Canadian city uh, on UNESCO. UNESCO's network of top learning cities in the world. That's the United Nations. People may have heard of it. And congratulations, by the way, my friend, as well, uh, to see you as a recipient of the uh, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee Medal for your contributions. Oh, that's that's a major you. accomplishment, and, and, and I hope you're very proud of that. Um, I, I, I am. I asked the question of our other, our fellow panelists, Pilar, let me ask you, what's in your personal life, uh, personal life, professional journey, you know what I'm saying, on your journey, um, what's, what's a big hurdle that you encountered and overcame, and how'd you do it? Really good question. So I think professionally, I think what, you know, I think what um, can be hurdles or things that are out of your control that sort of distract you from doing the good work that is part of your mandate. And that could be a tweet uh, that explodes about how a building looks or. Oh, uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> or it could be some of the things that we're dealing with societally that land in the library in terms of uh, houselessness and, and addictions and mental health things. So I think uh, those things are, you know, we do our best. And I think those are things that, that can be hurdles and challenges and that awareness. Personally, I would have to say for me, it's been that um, uh, sort of confidence uh, and belief that I can, I can do it. And I, and I still, you know, have that little voice sometimes that says, you know, are you, are, are you really the CEO of the public library? I don't know if you should be there. I don't think you're qualified. So that kind of, oh, that geez. self-doubt that I've, uh, that has been a barrier that I've, I have certainly had to work through, um, you know, throughout my career. So we'll see, that's the beauty of winning a platinum Jubilee medal is you just, you just wear it. You, you know, you just like, you, right, know, I can wear it. <laughs> you heard what, you know, Patrick Waugh, the great NHL goaltender, when Jeremy Roenick famously criticized him, he said, I'm sorry, I can't hear what Jeremy's saying. I have my two Stanley cup rings wedged in my ears. <laughs> and, uh, and so Pilar, you could see, you know, are you qualified to be CEO? I don't know. Let me ask my platinum Jubilee medal. That would always, that would always be <laughs> Good advice, Ryan. Good yeah. advice. Hey, let, let me ask you, let me go somewhere. Cause you just brought it up and I appreciate you did because we like uncomfortable conversations on the show there there has been some talk and I've seen scuttlebutt around the city people will talk about how I mean and I'm I'm paraphrasing but oh the, the main floor of the library downtown looks like a homeless shelter or I went or I, w I was downtown the library and all these you know people are are you know you know hanging out loitering out front and I don't feel safe at the library yet at the same time I see a lot of people pointing out that the library is for everybody and the point of it a is. library is a gathering so how do how do you reconcile like that's not an easy challenge to, to confront is it 
No, and it, and in, and we are not the only library. This is a phenomenon that's being experienced across North America. And in today, in fact, I'm chairing uh, the first meeting of a committee of the Canadian Urban Libraries Council on safety and, and uh, security. There's a summit that's being held uh, in the United States by Library Journal on safety and, and security. So I think it's just exacerbated with, with COVID. It's, it's probably been an, an, uh, uh, an issue for the past you know, decade, 20 years. And uh, I think it's a societal, this is not a library uh, issue. This is a societal issue and challenge. And I think we need really creative solutions. If there was a magic bullet, we would have found the solution. And these are complex issues that we all need to engage and, and uh, determine creative ways to, to help folks and, and better serve them. Uh, that's yeah, and the library is not it is not that's not our role. We need mm. we want to be doing early literacy programming. We want to be helping folks find a job, um, learn about different careers, or or uh, find a, a book that they haven't read, or help kids learn how to read. Those are the things that we we want to do, and yeah. uh, and that includes folks from all walks of life. So, but it's a balance. It's a balance, and 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 I think perhaps there has been a. a with this, with our current climate, we are experiencing things that uh, that hopefully will be resolved in the coming months, years ahead. Yeah, I love your optimism, and, and I think you're bang on. Be, I mean, well, to, that's that, you have to be optimistic and positive. Yeah, optimistic and realistic. I mean, I think that totally. life, life is about finding balances between those perspectives, right? Um, yeah. So, Simba, so you're you're so Lenica is doing a lot of work with regards to brain health in the context of, of Alzheimer's, dementia, etc. Um, is it is it a completely Different application. Can we talk about peak cognition and, and how your team, led by you uh, at Lenica, is working with athletes? This appears to be fascinating. Can you take us into it? Absolutely. So the initial component of our program was actually a virtual reality-based training program that aimed at training athletes' uh, cognitive skills. So their attention, their visual processing speed, uh, complex movement perception – all with the goal of improving their in-game performance. One of the things that is known now, especially at the competitive and high-profile uh, sports level, is that what separates great athletes from good athletes is not their physical skill, but what's going mentally. And so our system aimed at really honing and training those mental skills to help athletes unlock that last 10% of their performance so that they can truly be great. And so that was our initial program in which uh, is being used by some varsity sports teams, uh, some Olympic level athletes, as well as some NHL athletes, are also utilizing the platform to help them improve their mental performance so that they can become better athletes. The system itself is very similar to peak cognition because there's an aspect of it that uh, involves mental training. But then there's also an aspect of it that allows them to integrate the biometric information. Because as an athlete, we know that if they want to perform mentally, they still need to be sleeping well. Right. They still need to be managing their stress well. And so it's the same system, but being utilized for different uh, components. So a lot of our um, uh, sports uh, users, they use it to improve their performance. But in the event, like they get a concussion, they can use their pre-concussion performance to compare it to their post-concussion performance because our system allows them to quantify uh, the way they are performing cognitively. And if a person less ends up suffering from a stroke or gets dementia, we are eventually going to have enough data to be able to uh, normalize what performance data that you are expected or you perform on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you suffer from a cognitive impairment, we can use that as a benchmark as well. Wow. So it's the same system different markets so it's it's different than it's completely different than sports psychology right like it's not yeah. it's not training an athlete to not get down in the dumps if they're on a a losing skid or they haven't scored a goal in 10 games it's it's different than that it's it's actually training the brain to to fire more quickly or to perform better in the heat of battle yes so you can visualize it in terms of like if you go into the vr program where you are now immersed in a virtual environment the game allows you to track multiple objects simultaneously as they move and so if you think of a goalie they have to track the players they have to track the opponents they have to track the puck all simultaneously and be able to respond to what's happening in the gameplay 
our system presents this information in a more dynamic way and faster than what they'll naturally see when they're in the game. And so if they're able to process information that's moving at, let's say, 100 kilometers an hour, for lack of a better word, and they only experience 20 kilometers during the game, then their brain is able to process that information a lot easier, especially at critical phases of gameplay. This is absolutely amazing stuff. And and I know that me and I'm sure audience members are going to be keeping a keen eye on this as it further develops and becomes more predominant uh, in, in sport. Like everybody's looking to get the edge up. And I think there's a huge market for this kind of stuff. You're, you're like, yeah, tell me something I don't know. Uh, so <laughs> we'll, we'll be watching with great interest. I want to let all three of you know, as we prepare to wrap our conversation, we're so grateful that you've made time for us. Um, I want to give you like like 60 seconds advance notice, uh, Mega, before I have a question for you. Uh, I want to ask you for, for one piece of advice, uh, just so you have a second to think about it. One piece of advice that somebody gave you that has stuck with you, that has driven you, that has motivated you, one piece of advice. Before we get there, uh, Mega, I want to bring this full circle. Your work that you're doing with with Apega, and, and I should note that I've done uh, work with Apega. I've worked with them for almost 10 years hosting their events and sell, uh, host their golf tournament, and I've hosted their awards shows, and I just know that membership to be, to be just a wonderful group that desires to achieve excellence, and I know a big part of that is seeing – uh, equitable representation in its membership. And I understand that you've actually been playing a leading role in this 30 by 30 initiative where they want to see at least 30% of their membership uh, be women by the year 2030. And and that would represent, as if I need to tell you, doubling the number of women uh, in a Pegasus membership in the next seven years. So what does the road to get there look like? Yeah, um, so I'm fairly new to the group, um, but this work has been, APEGA is really passionate about having more women in the industry, and they always have been. Um, but in the recent years, we've gotten a lot of funding from the federal government to really make sustainable change um, and do a lot of research. Um, as engineers, we're very research oriented. So before we, you know, spend a lot of money on um, policy guidelines, we need to research what the barriers are and um, how to actually be effective in our strategies. So yeah, our numbers uh, aren't uh, looking super great right now, but I like, I think that there is a lot of optimism in the future because I think when you look at our membership, a lot of the membership um, before 2017 was a lot of older guys that went into engineering. Um, so they're still holding these positions in the industry and they make up a lot of the membership. But as the years go on and there are the older generation continues to retire, we're going to see this number go up quite a bit. And that's the expectation that we have is because there are more women going into the faculty of engineering and graduating from engineering. It's just that those numbers aren't seen in the overall picture because there's still so many older men holding mm. positions to say. Um, so, yeah. So I think once we see the retirement age approach in the next few years, um, we're going to see a huge change, but it's also a preparing industry for that change. Mm. So making sure that we have good resources for these women that we're actually not just getting them into the field, but we're retaining them because that's another issue is how to retain them long term and having policies, um, mat leave and flexible work hours and um, et cetera for men and women. So they don't have to feel like they have to pick between um, family versus work and et cetera. So yeah. there's a lot of work to still be done, but we're very optimistic. Yeah. And, and, and good people you know, contributing mm -hmm. to it, which is really encouraging. Mega, while you're holding the mic, can, can you think of one piece of advice that somebody gave you at some point in your life that really resonated? Yeah. Um, if you want to make real change, you have to get everyone on board. Hmm. Um, if I, you know, if I'm really passionate about women's rights, um, if it's just the women's that are, you know, taking up all the burden to make the change, it's a, it's a lot of work. Um, and not really fair. So it's it's really important for every single person to get on board to make real impact and to make real change and hold yourself accountable. So especially in engineering, because it's so male dominated, like we need the male membership to take this work seriously as well. Love it. Simba, what advice really resonated with you at one point in your life? Well, I was hoping for the one minute thinking warning. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think the advice that resonated with me um, was whatever you want to do, if it's important to you, once you figure it out, be willing to work really hard for it and realize that there are going to be setbacks and your ability to be able to deal with those setbacks gracefully will help you end up getting there. And so one of the things that I know, like even like where they are starting something new, anyone who's tried to innovate, whether it's a new company within the industry, realize that there's a lot of opportunities to learn, which people sometimes call failures. And just being able to bounce back consistently is very important to ensure that the vision that you have for a better world actually uh, materializes. I love that opportunities to learn, which some people call failures. I just wrote that down. I'm going to stick that. That'll be something I take with me. Simba. So thank you very much. Uh, Pilar, last word to you. Oh, this, it's hard going last. I know. Both, uh, Simba and Mega had uh, words that, that I was thinking myself, I'm going to maybe take a, take a different track. And it, it was a speaker who was a negotiator for the Iran Contra affair. And what he said, he was from New York and he, in his New York accent, he said, you gotta care but not that much. Ah. And the idea that you can't be so immersed and so passionate that you're not able to see the distance from something or the objectivity. So that kind of sticks with me. I love it. That's uh, Pilar Martinez, uh, CEO of Edmonton Public Library. We've also been lucky enough to be hanging out with Mega Sharma, the EDI coordinator at Apega, and uh, the CEO of Lenica Research Group, Simba Nayazika, all three of them, Edifier Award recipients, as featured and celebrated in the winter issue of Edify. You can find it online at edifyedmonton.com. Or, of course, you can find the print copy, the beautiful print copy around town, wherever you pick up your magazines. Thanks to the three of you. Have a wonderful weekend and keep up the incredible work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, Nice meeting you, Megan Simba. Yeah, Perfect. you too. Bye. Bye-bye. Look at that. Just bringing people together. I yeah. love it. That's what and that's it, what Friday the 13th is for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ron's email set the tone for us. He's like, we're going to be positive. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be encouraged and enlightened. See? Now I'm putting you on the spot. Oh, me? Did anybody ever give you a piece of advice that stuck with you? Or do you have like a mantra or something? That, yeah, like, I do. When yeah? I first moved to Edmonton, the guy who actually gave me the job to come here and be music director for, uh, it was a nightclub a chain actually too yeah. at the time, which no longer exists. So I won't even mention them. But he said, try to always be a yes man, like in the room. Try to be the guy, not that like, you know, does what anyone says, but try to be that guy. Even if your first inkling is to say, no, that could be hard. I don't yep. want to do that. I'm tired. Just try to say yes, because you're going to say yes to something, an event, uh, some sort of job, sort of, some sort of opportunity, and you're going to surprise yourself. Hmm. So I kind of took that with me, and hey, hey, look where it led me. Now we're here. Yeah. You and me. Yeah. And, and, and you've never You said- asked me, I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's good. I've shared this before on the show. Mine would be a guy shared it with me in university. It's a, it's a quote, mm. uh, but I love it. It sort of sets the scene. It says, a person should always wear a coat with two pockets. Mm. And in one pocket, a note that says, I am nothing but dust and ash. And in the other pocket, a note that says the world was created for me. Wow. And I love it. It's yeah. the, the finding that balance, right? The, yeah. the humility and the audacious nature of going out to to achieve what you think you might be able to achieve. And 100%. I love that. I would love to put this out to real talkers. I would I would love for you to let us know what, what what's the mantra or the driving force. What's the bit of advice that stuck with you, that somebody put in front of you that just absolutely seared its way into your memory? You can send us an email anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com or of course hit us up on Twitter, Instagram or TikTok using the hashtag RealTalkRJ that round is presented by our friends at Urban Timber and of course we also celebrate Real Talk sponsors every show like the family owned team at Eden Landscaping Mike and and his entire group have been supporting real conversations on Real Talk since the very beginning. They bring outdoor spaces to life as a custom landscape builder and this weekend I want to encourage you to Check out their website, landscapeedmonton.ca. They've got a great portfolio there where you can see what all the talk actually translates into, what it looks like when you go with custom landscaping services like stone and woodwork, or or how can the West Coast meet modern design, and, and what does that look like? They've got their uh, all kinds of, of pollinator approaches as we come to a better understanding of what sustainable design looks like. LandscapeEdmonton.ca, you can see how Eden Landscaping has been leading the charge. It's a great time of year to get the conversation started so they can hit the ground running when the ground thaws and bring your outdoor space to life. Can we show a couple photos? 
the ones that I sent you yesterday. Oh, yeah, for I sure. I was lucky enough to hang out and break bread with the leadership team at Friesen Brothers at their award-winning South Edmonton store, the Rabbit Hill store. If you're listening on podcast, uh, we're showing on YouTube right now. This is Ooh. the this is the braised beef short rib. I'll take those Brussels sprouts. With they the look perfect. roasted Brussels sprouts and the warm potato salad. Mm. And this is a mind-blowing feast. <laughs> That Friesen Brothers has going all the time in their kitchens. You know, so I'm sitting there and we're chatting about our future with Friesen Brothers and we're so grateful to have them as a partner. And I'm looking around and the restaurant part of that store is packed with people that are enjoying I good, fresh, quality food either before or after the grocery shop. And if you don't want to sit down, there's tons of it ready to go. I love that. Every day, fresh food right there, fresh pizza, fresh everything. Isn't it great? They got their sourdough sandwiches, they got their smash burgers, and and of course, I had to wrap. You're going to go, Jesperson, you seriously crushed a cinnamon bun after the beef short rib? (laughs) Well, yes, I did. Yes, I did. I had the sourdough cinnamon bun and a nice black coffee after to wrap it all up. Uh, You can check out Friesen Brothers in 16 Alberta locations. More details online at Friesen.com. Friesen Brothers is Alberta grown and Alberta owned. I could talk about that beef short rib for like 30 minutes. (laughs) Honestly, like, do I need a knife? No, I didn't need a knife. Did I use horseradish? Oh, baby, yeah. What a meal it was. Hey, big shout out to our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park as well. It's still January, which means it's still buy one, get one free on Dilly Bars and Dairy Queen sandwiches. That's right. These are the wildly popular grab-and-go options. They stand up perfectly in your fridge or freezer, I should say. And, of course, there's nothing better than open it up. The kids, the adults want a treat, and you've got six or 12 Dilly bars or DQ sandwiches or ready 24. to rock. Or 24 or 36 or 48 <laughs> or however many. Hell, go buy another freezer and stock up on the buy one, get one free promotion through January at the Dairy Queens in Palisades, De Mayo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. I feel like I know why they gave me the gift cards in my stocking this year because it's a lure, right? Like I went in. <laughs> I got the free ones with the gift cards, and then I've been back twice yeah. since then. Oh, so they know like, what they're doing. Way to go. You yeah, they know, they know exactly what they're doing at Dairy Queen. Absolutely. You know, every Friday, uh, we look to you. As a matter of fact, this kind of happens through the week, and then Friday we bring it all together. Uh, we want to know, quite frankly, and, and, and here's kind of, I guess, in a way where – we're guilty. We, we do press the anger button a little bit, <laughs> but it's good. It's like in a blow off valve kind of a sense. Yeah, so we can bring ourselves back to equilibrium, <laughs> right? We release the pressure. We read your words and it's all courtesy of our wonderful friends at local environmental services. It's a Friday tradition we call trash talk. All right. I appreciate this from name withheld due to fear of excommunication from the rest of society. Okay. We won't read the name. This individual says, I am so sick and tired of the conversations about how the unvaccinated are thought of. I am one of these horrible people who chose not to be vaccinated. Why? Well, a few years ago, I went in for a flu shot. And after the shot, I had a reaction known as Julian Barr syndrome. It's rare. It affects the nerves and can cause paralysis, which is what happened to me. Lasted 13 hours, the scariest 13 hours of my life. When the mandates for the vaccine came out, I was petrified. I went to my doctor and asked, what should I do? Her answer, take a Benadryl and hope it works. Not the most reassuring answer, so I chose to remain unvaccinated to preserve my mobility. Did I get COVID? Yes. I was sick for two days and then I was fine. So please, Jesperson, don't lump all unvaccinated people together as a bunch of whack job anti-vaxxers. Some of us had a difficult decision to make. Thank you, name withheld. We appreciate your note. This one from Marie, who says, Jespo, after seeing the comments of, of one of your viewers on YouTube uh, making you know about obesity being a choice, what the fuck? Says, I haven't, haven't we got past this? I recently watched a 60 Minutes episode on obesity. She says, I sent it to you on Twitter to watch. So finally, professionals are studying and agreeing that a number, uh, the number one cause for obesity is genetics. Marie says, I fought my weight. Uh, Since after my first child was born, I've been on every diet invented since the beginning of time. I've lost more weight in my lifetime than the average elephant carries. I've even spent good hard-earned money on gastric sleeve surgery. And guess what, says Marie? I'm still overweight, okay? According to all the scales and the charts and the graphs out there, I'm 67 years of age. I ride horses. I recently retired from 43 years of nursing. Thank you for your service, Marie. Says that's a very physically demanding job, by the way. And I don't eat much. 
due to the gastric sleeve surgery, but I put all that weight I lost following surgery back on, so tell me that I'm fat due to eating. Anybody that believes that, I say, fuck you! You have no idea the sacrifices I've made to try to be that skinny person you all think I should be, and I'm finally learning to love my body as it is. And I wish... I wish I could have done that as a child. I suffered from anorexia as a teen because of public opinion. I'm 5'8". I was 100 pounds when I was 24 years old. She says, after so many years of listening to people that don't have a clue about obesity, I had enough and I had to write in. Discrimination at its worst is what obese people deal with on the daily. And it's time for a new reality, all you uneducated mouthpieces. That from Marie, giving you something to chew on. And we'll wrap this up from Mark. Who says, holy cow, Jesperson. Now, this is an Alberta story. Do I understand this correctly? Our provincial parks minister, Todd Lowen, is against the federal park ministry's plan to shuttle bus people into one of Canada's premier mountain locations, Moraine Lake. We got to talk more about this on the show, by the way, next week. He says, so here's the genius idea. Pave over Majestic Mountain Parkland so more cars can park up there. What in the ding dong dandy is wrong with Minister Lowen? Doesn't he know a business opportunity when he hears it? You can have vendors selling food, clothing, guided tours, souvenirs to people waiting for a bus. Heck, Alberta's shuttle bus companies can come forward and offer to help. Even better, all that federal money will come back to Alberta, and it'll be like equalization. Nice try, Mark. He says, but hold on a second. Maybe that country bumpkin savant minister is doing his job. He is the minister of parks, making parking lots. I can't wait to hear about his next idea, draining mountain lakes to make room for gas stations. It's big vision thinking like this that really sets this government apart from the rest. In fact, from the average Albertan with a modicum of common sense and intelligence, from the party that brought you coal mining in the mountains, a $30 million war room embarrassment, a racist writing social studies curriculum, and a sovereignty law that even they don't understand, I can hardly wait for the next big idea. Remember, real talkers, says Mark, when you elect a clown, expect a circus to follow. That from Mark. Hey, these emails are all real and they're received to talk at ryanjesperson.com, presented as always by local environmental Environmental services. Keep it local at localenvironmental.ca. Next week, we've got a banging lineup coming up on the show. You can learn about it all ahead of time by subscribing to our Real Talk Sunday message. It's a free email where we lay out what you can expect and highlight highlights from past shows. You can sign up at the bottom of the page on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Johnny Infamous, have an amazing weekend. Real Talkers, have an amazing weekend. I'll see some of you out at Jasper in January, and we'll talk on Monday. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, Executive Producer Josh Dunford, Technical Producer John Hicks, General Manager Katie Cook-Chivers, Account Coordinator Lawrence Durlego, Human Resources Lena Shepard, Website Design Mike Johnston, VoiceOver by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's Editorial Board is Supriya Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Randy Morin, Anne Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjesperson.com.